Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. I am your host, as always, the Maxinadian. And no, you are not going insane. No, you did not forget that you followed this podcast. <clears throat> um this podcast actually used to be called the Red, Orange, and Blue Podcast, so you're not going insane. You know, you did not follow a random podcast, and you don't remember. Uh, this was the Red, Orange, and Blue Podcast, where I talked about the Lions, Tigers, and the Red Wings. But I started thinking on it, and I'm like, well, you know, the Tigers aren't very good, and I've never really been a massive baseball guy in the first place. I love the Lions, but I don't know enough about football to actually talk about it, stuff like that, you know. Uh, this the last like two or three years was really the only time first time I've gotten really into the Lions, so I don't believe I'm necessarily not qualified, but I don't think I'm at a level where I can actually talk about them in an analytical or you know expert ish. You know I don't think I could talk about them with believing that I know my shit. Um, but with the Red Wings, I'm all over that, and as you guys know, I am one of the biggest Red Wing fans in existence. Um, and I love the team. I love the team. Last season, obviously, disappointment. Um, I wish I could have done an episode on that, but, you know, things got in the way, and I want to apologize to you guys for that. Um, I know in the last episode I did, I did say that I would try to get one episode a week out for you guys, and, uh, I failed at that. I made that episode, and then this podcast went dark for, uh, like four months. And probably more, actually. I don't remember what the last episode was. But I do apologize for that. I wasn't planning on the, the podcast just going completely dark and ceasing all functions. But when things get in the way with your life and stuff like that, some things have to take a back seat. And unfortunately, the podcast was one of the things that needed to take a back seat. And if you guys have followed me on YouTube from, you know, my main channel, The Mexinadian, where I do gameplay stuff and whatnot you will notice that my uploads have been very inconsistent. They've been, you know, once a month at best, and I barely hit that anymore. So things have just gotten in the way, but I'm back. I've managed to get some to- figure out some way to do this, but I will not promise one episode a week. It's going to be more of a whenever I can basis, so there's not going to be a set day. There's not going to be, you know, a set schedule. It is just going to be whenever I can do it. Um, and, you know, following big news and stuff like that, obviously, um, odds are I will end up doing episodes for that, emergency episodes, stuff like that, but working afternoons and work, just my work schedule and my life schedule, stuff like that, it does get difficult to maintain a schedule of any sort, so thankfully I do have the time to come back to this podcast now, and I'm excited to be back and talking about a subject that I believe I can really sink my teeth into, and that is the Detroit Red Wings. So, obviously, the Detroit Red Wings have, they've been in a state of flux as of late. Um, They've been in this weird, this, this state of flux where it's, okay, they're good, but not good enough to make the playoffs, and it's really weird. They're very mid, um, and They've made moves, you know, free agency just happened, <clears throat> sorry, free agency happened and the draft happened, all that good stuff, but I want to go back farther to the end of their season, where they ended up missing the playoffs by a, a tiebreaker, which I'm, I, I want to get into that too. Um, the tiebreaker's dumb. Straight up the tiebreaker they have is dumb. It should not be possible for a team that has three less wins to make the playoffs over somebody who has more wins than them. That just doesn't make sense. Um, If the the tiebreakers should not be, the first tiebreaker should not be regulation wins, first of all. Um, The tiebreaker should be wins in general, like if you're tied with points, wins and just wins, Um, if you have the same amount of wins, which is unlikely, then you go to regulation wins. Then you go to, what is it? Um, I forgot what it was. Uh, goal differential, I believe it is, the third tiebreaker. And so on and so forth. It's it, like you shouldn't have a situation where a team that has, A, the worst goal differential in NHL history to make the playoffs. The Washington Capitals had a minus, what, 31 goal differential. 
and they made the playoffs. That is actually the worst in NHL history, and it is mind-bogglingly baffling that they were able to make the playoffs on that. And you showed they were not a playoff team whatsoever. They may think they're a playoff team now because I don't know what the fuck they're doing. Apparently building to compete again. I don't know. Um, But, yeah, there should not be a reality where a team has three less wins and a minus a negative 31, especially goal differential, and make the playoffs. And that leads me to my next topic. The, the, the point system's broken. We've known this for a while, but the point system's broken. The New York Islanders had less wins than the Washington Capitals, but still had two more points, I think three more points more than them with 94. Because they had 16 overtime losses, means they got 16 points from losing. That should not be possible. You should not get any points for losing. Go to a 3 2 1 point system or a 2 1 0 point system, something like that. It should be, personally, I'm a fan of a 3 2 1 point system. Three points for a regulation win, two points for an overtime win, one point for a shootout win, zero points for the loser. You should not be rewarded for not getting the job done. That should not be a thing. There is no other league in the world, as far as I know, there's no other league in the world that has that type of system. You know, the. The NFL is solely off based off of wins, uh, like your win rec- win loss record. The MLB is based off of wins as well. Um, basketball, I believe, is also based off of wins. Like there's, it's all based off of like points per uh, win per, uh, win loss record or points percentage or whatever, and just not points. It is literally just not points based. And I understand the NHL has to do, you know, it for reasons that I can't remember right now for whatever reason. But it's it, it's upsetting. Like, straight up it's upsetting. Yes, I can't blame the point system for al- the entirety of the reason that Detroit didn't make the playoffs. Because ultimately, when it mattered, they failed. Uh, Mar- when, once Dylan Larkin went out, this team turned into fucking 2019 Red Wings. It was very upsetting to watch. And I mean, God bless Lucas Raymond, dude. He's gonna get fucking paid, which we'll get into that too today. But yeah, man, I I don't know the NHL. They're never gonna get rid of that point system. Um, you know the uh, uh, women's professional hockey league, the WPHL. They have the three to one point system, and it's they also have a. I can't. I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, I could be wrong on this though. Their system doesn't allow it. It not doesn't allow, but it makes you less likely to just completely tank. Because I believe what they do is they play, and whoever has the best record out of the teams that missed the playoffs or something like that gets the number one pick. I can't remember. I could be sh- talking shit out of my ass right now. Like, I have no fucking clue. Uh, I didn't think to look this up before because I was not anticipating needing to talk about it. But, yeah, I just... That, that, that's my little bit of a rant uh, for that because it's just something I need to talk about. I've talked about it a lot on Twitter. Uh, you know, you can follow me at... The underscore Max and on Twitter. Um, follow me for Jeff Petrie content. But yeah, it's uh, I don't know. It's 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 just upsetting that that was a reason that Detroit missed the playoffs. They should have made the playoffs, regardless of their tanking. They should have made made the playoffs. But you know, it's neither here nor there. Uh, but let's get into what you guys really wanted to hear me talk about, which is free agency and the draft. We're gonna start off with the NHL draft. Um, the 2024 entry draft, Detroit had seven, eight picks, I believe. Um, and this, I will say the first round was the most predictable for Detroit. And I see a lot of people cause the, in the first round, they took Michael Brand Segnegard and that was one of the worst kept secrets in the entire league. Like there was not a single NHL team that didn't think that Detroit was going to take Michael Brand Signigard because he's he's the quint if you were to go into a lab and make a hockey player that is exactly the Steve Eiserman type it would be Michael Brand Signigard 200 foot forward who has the 
he's got an incredible shot. Like he's got one of, if not the best, I won't say the best shot because you know Cole Eisenman, Berkeley Cat, and Mert Macklin Celebrini, they've all got great shots. But he has one of the best shots in the entire twenty twenty four draft. And that is one of the biggest upsides for him. He had in, uh, I believe it was Sweden's second pro league, uh, the Osvenja. I can't pronounce Swedish words, you guys. Uh, in 41 games, he had 8 goals, 10 assists, 18 points. Which is, you know, it's a bit, I won't say it's concerning or a red flag, but there is some road of caution there just because, you know, Axel Sandin Pelika is playing in the SHL. And he put up more points, if I I believe so. Um, I want to double check that real quick, so that way I'm not talking out of my ass again. Uh, he put up the same exact amount of points. Okay, never mind. Uh, I was in less games, but you know, it's they are two different players, mind you. Obviously, Axel Pelik is an offensive defenseman. Brand Segnigard is a 200 uh, foot guy. But it is a little bit of cause for concern because he's also an overager, I believe, for this draft. So it is a little bit of cause of concern, but not nothing to be, you know, waving the red flag and being upset about uh, from for the pick, you know. And I know a lot of people are upset that they didn't take Cole Eiserman with their pick, even though he was there. He ended up going to uh, the Islanders, I believe. But yeah, it, it you gotta you, a lot of you guys have to realize that fourteen other teams passed on Cole Eiserman as well. So either all of those teams are just stupid, which in that case, why are you just ragging on the Red Wings? Or there's something he didn't either he didn't interview well, or you know his personality just rubbed teams the wrong way, stuff like that, because. Uh, Rumor, the rumors and reports, stuff like that, said that he was so focused on chasing the all-time goal record for the USHL that, or the USNTDP, I believe, that he ended up just like not neg- just negating all of his other all the other facets of his game. Which he is a very one-dimensional player. He is just a guy who can shoot really well. His defense is literally nothing. And it's, you know, so it's, it's nothing that, you know, people didn't know, but a lot of the reports say that he was so focused on just getting that record that he, you know, negated other facets of the game. He was playing selfishly stuff like that. So that those are personality traits that personally, I don't believe Eiserman likes. And Eisenman's a big personality guy. We all know this. He's a fantastic per- – he's, he's an incredibly huge personality guy, which is why he gave Rana away for nothing, which is why he moved Mantha, which is – you know, he's he's proven that he's a personality guy. And if you don't have a personality that helps the locker room, then you're not going to make any moves. What's You're, you're not going to make any noise in, in the, on the team, and Eisenman's not going to be interested in you. So – yeah, I'm, I'm excited for Brandsig Nygaard. His shot is great. And he's a 200 foot winger, and he's I think I think he's got potential to be a 30 goal scorer, like a lot of the guys on the Detroit's drafted. And uh, oddly enough, the only guy, uh, the only first round pick Detroit's drafted that I don't think will be a 30 goal scorer, at least a consistent 30 goal scorer, is Marco Casper. I think Danielson has that potential. I think Brandsig Nygaard has that potential. Obviously, Raymond's got that potential. You know, he, he's the, Casper's the only one really that I don't think will be a consistent 30 goal scorer. I think that he'll probably score 30 goals at least once in his career, once or twice. But at the end of the day, I don't believe he's a guy you rely on for 30 goals. You rely on him for 20, maybe 25 goals. Um, and also grit and getting in people's faces, stuff like that. And Marco Casper stuff. But yeah, Brand Signegard, I'm not upset with this pick whatsoever. He's, he is... As much as I would have liked Cole Iserman, I'm not upset with the Brandsig Nier pick whatsoever. Uh, in the second round, they took Max Plante. Plante? Plante? I, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Um, I just called him uh, Big Flower. So <laughs> that's that's what I'm calling him. But with USN TDP, he had uh, six goals, 23 assists, 29 points in 25 games. He was over a point per game. And it's a good it's a good pick. He sh- he's a left-handed left wing. And if he is, 
uh, if he if he pans out, he could be a power play threat. He's definitely somebody who has potential to work out. And uh, I'm looking at the hockey uh, hockey BD page, and that's not at all what I should be on for this. Um, I don't know why I'm not an elite prospect. So I'm talking about prospects, probably because I'm a fucking moron. Just trying to get to elite prospects now. Okay, elite prospects always take so long to fucking load, dude. It's so bad. Uh, yes, Max Plante, that Plante, big flower, is who I want to talk about. Uh, okay. So, yeah, uh, Elite Prospects has him as an incredibly skilled player who has a very good backhand, uh, great playmaker, and, uh, he's very good under pressure. That's pretty much what they've got him as. Um, what they, you know, what they say is Plante is one of the most skilled passes in the draft, especially off the backhand. He feathers the puck through the tiniest of openings. Defensive pressure only empowers him. He takes advantage of assertive defending by ripping a pass right through it. He deceives enough to open lanes, but also knows when to make a quick pass for the counter counterattack. So he could very well be a, a you know Patrick Kane from Wish.com if he pans out. Uh, obviously, it's second round. Second rounders, they're like most of them don't. Anybody outside the first round, there's like what five seven percent of them that make the league or something like that. So, or can become consistent NHLers. But yeah, he's. Definitely somebody that I would keep my eye on for a uh, non-first-round pick who could potentially turn out to be something. Um, so it's... I, I will say Eiserman did very well outside of the first round in this draft. Uh, I didn't get to watch all of it. I watched the first round, and then the second round I just kind of kept glancing at from time to time. So I don't know the backgrounds from a lot of these guys. Um but in the third round, they took on... I don't know how to say this name either, you guys. I am on... on. I'm just going to say Andre Beecher. I don't know if the J in there means anything. Um, but he's another left-handed shot. Uh, he's a winger, I believe. Uh, yeah, he's a left-handed winger. Oh, center winger, my bad. He plays both. Um, and he's another playmaker. Uh, he has, he's great off the transition and, you know, he's basically another playmaker essentially. And he also has, like I said, Eisenman's draft picks through outside of the first round were fantastic. Like I said, I love Branson Negard, but he went very upside with a lot of his picks and out of sight of the first round. Um, he had... In total, four goals, ten or not in total. Uh, he had four goals, ten assists for fourteen points in thirteen games with the Czechia U twenty, um, and then in the World Junior Championships last season, I believe. No, this season, he had three goals, seven assists for ten points in seven games uh, for Czechia in the U twenties. So he's also another guy that you should keep your eye on. Um, and from this point on, I'm not even going to bother listing out you know how good they are because I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna you know bullshit you guys I have no fucking clue who half these guys are um, I've never been a massive you know prospect follower but you know I'm willing to look into some of these guys for you know if necessary uh, Landon Miller goaltender uh, he had an 889 with the Sioux Greyhounds. Uh, not, but he went 17 and six, so can't really be mad at that. And then outside of that, you guys get to the places where even most of your insiders and draft guys don't really know much about John Whipple, Charlie Forslund, Austin Baker, and Fisher Scott. Fisher Scott is an interesting one, though. He um, he's another one who I could see being a bit of a dark horse to make the team uh, at some point just because of everything I've seen from him is, and granted I haven't seen a lot from him, 
like I said, this is, I mean, the dude's seventh round pick. If he was worth much at all or a guaranteed thing, then he would have been on everybody's radar. But I did look into him a little bit because I like, it's one of the things I like to do is look into like the late round draft picks, see if they could be anything. Um, and he's pretty solid. He was half a point per game, over half a point per game with, uh, the, 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 the book fighting. I, that is the, it's a USHL thing. Um, he was an associate captain and, uh, he had eight goals, 25 assists, 33 points in 61 games. He's a defense he's a defenseman and he's, he, he's got, uh, the ability to become something. He's six foot two. Uh, what is he left-handed? So another left-handed guy in the fucking prospect pool, but you know, whatever, right? Hand, right. are difficult to come by. So yeah, I, I, he's another guy that could become something. Um, and like I said, I'm not going to bullshit you guys. I have very little clue about any of these guys. I'm, as you can tell, I didn't do much research into them in the first place. But, you know, I, I, you guys can look them up. There's a lot of them, all of them have potential to make it. But obviously, not all of them are. Realistically, the only person from this draft that will likely make the NHL is Branson Negard. So... You know, you guys can look into these guys on your own. Fuck you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I I just don't. I I as much as I love prospects, I don't have the time or really the need or want to look deep dive into most of them, especially late rounders. Um, even though like I look up highlights from late rounders and stuff like that, but I don't do deep dives into them. So, but yeah, the 2024 draft I would say is a pretty big success for the for Iserman. I know, like I said, a lot of people were upset about Brand Signigard being their pick when Cole Eiserman was there, but we don't know the reasons. Obviously, Brand Signigard was always going to be the pick because they wasted zero time pretty much going for him. Uh, I can't say that. There were talk. They were still sitting at the desk when the time was on the clock. You know, Eiserman, Draper, and Lidstrom, they were talking, like maybe we want, making it seem like, oh, maybe we're going to trade the pick and stuff like that. And realistically, that likely was never going to happen. Um, I doubt he was ever planning on trading the pick unless it was to trade up. Uh, so, you know, it's it was a good draft in my opinion. I, I give the draft, I, I give it a B plus, you know, maybe eh, maybe a B minus, you know, because Cole Eisman was there, but it's whatever. But besides the draft, free agency started a few days ago. And, boy, was it a doozy. Uh, there was a lot of contracts handed out. I think there was a billion dollars in contracts handed out in the first day or something like that. Uh, first day or two. So, it's going to be interesting to see how everything else plays out. Because, obviously, a, a lot of people are upset with Eisenman, too. Because everybody's upset with fucking Eisenman at this point, for whatever reason. Um, I'm not, and I know most of Red Wings Twitter isn't, but... You got casual fans who only tune in when the team's actually, air quotes, good or watchable. Like, most of those guys weren't there in 2019. I had something in my mouth. Uh, and most of these people weren't there in 2019 when they were, they had the second worst record in NHL history. Um, so, you know, it's, it, 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 it's a bit upsetting to watch and see all that stuff, but you kind of just got to brush it aside and be like, all right, these guys, they don't actually care about the product. They just care about, you know, they only care about the team when the team is good. They're not actual true fans. They're casual fans, which is nothing wrong with that. You can be a casual fan of any team you want. I'm a casual fan of the Arizona, oh, I was a casual fan of the Arizona Coyotes, but they don't exist anymore. Um, and I've also been a pretty big, uh, why can't I remember the name? It's fucking blocked out of my memory for whatever reason. Dallas. Fucking Dallas. How did I forget Dallas? I've been a pretty big Dallas fan for a while. Um, so, you know, it's it's just something you gotta look away from. You know, I, I always have the urge to correct these people, but there's no getting through to them. They're always gonna come up with an excuse. You know, they're gonna say, you know, the uh, why Eisenman should be fired. We haven't made the playoffs in the eight years, in eight years, stuff like that. Uh, his The Iser plan has failed and whatnot. And then you tell them, well, no, only two of his draft picks have ever been on the team, have been on the team since he took over. And, you know, he's never gotten a top draft pick. 
So it's going to naturally take longer for those guys to develop. If you don't draft in the top three, the odds of that pick making the team in, you know, right out of the drafts are pretty low. And even then, they're still going to have to wait another year or two to be able to actually confidently be put on the team and on a regular basis. Obviously, call-ups will happen and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, those those people are hard to argue with, are hard to argue with just because it is like talking to a brick wall. It is very difficult to make any sort of ration, have any sort of rational conversation with them. So, but anyways, free agency, uh, obviously the big names that everybody from in Detroit wanted are gone. They were gone instantly, dude. Like, and uh, I'm, I'm not mad that I didn't sign any of them at this point because Steven Stamkos was given a four year, $8 million deal in Nashville. Nashville just grabbed all the good guys. Apparently like Nashville just straight up took the Vegas route and was like, we're just going to sign all the best players in the league at this point. So they signed Stamkos to four years to $8 million. And that's a bit wild. Uh, I would not pay that much for a 30 plus year old Steven Stamkos who is a power play merchant, mind you, and also a Kucherov merchant. So at least at this stage in his life. So they signed him. They signed Jonathan Marshall to a reasonable reasonable contract. I think it was five years at five point five million. Um, I can't remember his name, but the defenseman, uh, Seki, something like that. I can't remember his fucking name. They signed him to a lot of money for a long time. Uh. Washington, I believe, signed Patrick Roy, or not Patrick, fucking, they signed Roy, the defenseman, to, like, a $6 million deal. Seattle signed uh, Chandler Stevenson to, like, a $6 million deal. Uh, they signed Brandon Montour to, like, a four-year deal, something like that. It's It was wild, the contracts that were being given out. But thankfully, Eisenman stood pat. I say this very genuinely. Thankfully, he stood pat and didn't cave into the market values for some of these guys. And uh, he he signed up more people than people thought. But going through the list, Jack Campbell, which is a big surprise for everybody. There's going to be a theme in this one, mind you, by the way. Uh, he signed Jack Campbell to a league minimum contract. And it's not a bad signing. He's obviously going to end up in uh, Grand Rapids with Kosa. He's going to be the veteran backup for Kosa, likely. And the odds of him being on the wings just solely depend on health. Uh, we're going to get to the whole goaltending thing in a bit, but yeah, league minimum for Jack Campbell, who is likely just taking this job to regain his confidence, get back into the swing of things, and uh, you know, just really try to become the goaltender he once was. Then that that's all you can really ask for him, uh, for him to do. So it's uh, yeah, I'm I'm happy with the signing. I, I genuinely am. It doesn't cost much. It ends up, you know, if it's something you got to do, you can always probably move him stuff like that, or you just keep him buried in Grand Rapids all season. And Jack Campbell's a solid backup to Kosa. He's always been a solid backup throughout his career. Obviously, last season he was so dog shit, but. I believe he'll bounce back, and it's, you know, it's all only just a matter of him regaining that confidence. So, yeah, Jack Campbell, he, like I said, didn't play very well at all last season. Before he got sent down to Edmonton's farm team uh, in the AHL, he had an 873 safe percentage. And, yeah, it's, uh, it wasn't good for him, mind you. It wasn't very good. And even before that, he was an 888 save percentage goalie for Edmonton. But, you know, that Edmonton team still made the playoffs. Then again, they had Stuart Skinner as well on his game. But regardless, yeah, Jack Campbell, $775,000 league minimum, going to Grand Rapids likely. Then again, we said that about fucking Alex Lyon, and that never happened, and look what happened with Lyon. Uh, but the big one from day one was Eric Gustafson. Eric Gustafson was... You know, I'm I, I was very I'm still very happy with Eric Gustafson, Gustafson, and when he signed it, I was very happy. It's a uh, two point two five million for two years, I believe. I don't know why I don't have this up right now, even though I could have swore that I had it up. 
uh, $2 million even for two years, and he's a, go- he's a ghost of spare replacement. He's definitely a ghost of spare replacement. Obviously, he's not going to bring in the same exact amount of points and offensive ta- talent that Ghost brought, but the difference is Gustafson can play defense. Shane Ghost of spare was the biggest black hole defensively I've ever seen. And Gustafson, while he may not be fantastic on defense, he is, you know, still a better defender than Shane Ghost Spare. He had a, he was in uh, uh, New York last season. He had six goals, twenty five assists for thirty one points. It was a plus three, which doesn't really matter uh, in seventy six games. So yes, that's the New York Rangers we're talking about. But Detroit needed somebody who can run a power play and also provide offensive ability from offensive prowess from the blue line and they do have guys that fit them build obviously uh most cider has been able to can do that and has done that in the past uh jeff petrie can do that uh, i think even simon edvinson could do that but having a dedicated power play one quarterback like eric gustafson who you know can move the puck who you know can score goals if need be and is also solid def- not solid but decent halfway decent defensively that's definitely a good signing. Um, the only problem is we've got like eight defensemen now. I don't I don't know what we're supposed to do with all these defensemen, but it's not nearly as many defensemen as we have goaltenders. But we're going to get into goaltenders again. Uh, the first signing of day one, however, though, was William Lagason. William Lagason he played for uh, Toronto and Anaheim last season, getting a combined four points in forty games. So. Not very offensively talented, but he's easily either going to Grand Rapids or going to be the seventh defenseman uh, on the team. My guess is that he's going to Grand Rapids. You know, William Lagason, you can put on waivers, and he's likely not going to get claimed, but if he does, oh fucking well. So, you know, this is pretty much a nothing signing at this point. This is a man. This is basically a signing to give competition to guys like Edvinson, like uh, Johansson, Tumisto, those, you know, the prospect defensive prospects. Uh, Tyler Mott is an interesting one, though. Tyler Mott, he played uh, for the Tampa Bay Lightning last season, and he had six goals, three assists for nine points. He's a minus eight. Now, I know people are going to look at that minus eight and be like, well, he's just not a good player. Well, to the contrary, actually. uh, He's actually really good defensively. The only reason he's got a minus in that plus minus category, like I think he's minus 20 in his career, is because he's not offensively gifted. So, you know, putting him on the fourth line with, say, I don't know, Joe Valeno and Christian Fisher or Marco Casper and Christian Fisher or somebody, you know, that could be a really fantastic shutdown line. Um, Sorry, that was my phone. So, obviously, a lot of people with... Christian Fisher re-signing. Christian Fisher did re-sign to like a $1.2 million deal for one year, which everybody was ecstatic about. I was happy about it. And he, uh, so everybody wants to see the Rasmussen Fisher cop line come back out. Cause that line was fantastic pretty much all season. Um, there they had their moments, but that, that line was the epitome of a grind line. They would go in, beat you down, play hard and probably maybe score a goal or two. So it, 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 it Tyler Mott could play that role potentially, but he would definitely be more of a shutdown role, play shutdown role than a you know grindy, give some offensive pressure type role. So you know Tyler Mott, I believe, is a solid signing. You can slot him in on your fourth line, and he can be the seventh man. He could be the odd man out, and you know it's. It's a signing. It's, he's, he's a guy. Like what we said about Christian Fisher last season, yeah, that's him. Uh, Joe Snively. This is another interesting one. Uh, Joe Snively was in the AHL this year. He played for the... Sorry if you hear fireworks outside. It's fucking 4th of July. Happy 4th of July, by the way, everybody. Um, but he played for Washington last season. He played for the Calder winning Hershey Bears, back-to-back Calder Cup champions. Uh, but when he was up for Washington, he played three games, didn't get any points. But he was the le- – he was he had like 30 points in the Calder Cup playoffs, something like that. So 
definitely a solid depth signing for a guy who could potentially come up and, you know, cover for injury, and he will probably do fantastic things in Grand Rapids. And Lord knows Grand Rapids is going to need that. Obviously, with a lot of these signings, they're going to Grand Rapids, and they are probably going to end up being just there. You know, they're probably just going to be replacements for guys who are coming up onto the roster because, let's face it, Marco Casper, Carter Mazur, Nate Danielson, <coughs> uh, Simon Edvinson, they're all not likely to make the roster. I believe Marco Casper and Ed- and uh, Mazur have better shots of making the roster than Nate Danielson does. It all depends on how training camp tr- turns out, obviously. Uh, but obviously, Edvinson's going to be up on the roster. Eisenman said that in his presser today, that Edvinson's going to be on the roster, likely. Um, Johansson is going to be on the roster, probably get some, probably, and get games in. So, you know, as far as forwards go, I believe they've only got, like, one spot left for that. Um, you know, they still have to sign Jonathan Bear, and they still have to sign Joe Valeno, Lo- Lucas Raymond, uh, Mo Sider. You know, the RFAs, they still got to be re-signed. So it depends on if Detroit wants to keep those guys or not as well. Obviously, you're going to keep Raymond and Sider, but Berggren and Valeno are up in the air because Berggren reportedly turned down a contract earlier in the season, earlier last season, and nobody knows the reasons for it, but, you know, he supposedly turned down a contract offer, which would make you think he doesn't want to be here, but he accepted, the, he was given a qualifying offer, stuff like that, and he accepted it. Um... Although I don't know if you have to accept qualifying offers. I don't know the whole thing about qualifying offers. It's it, it's out of my pay grade. I just talk about shit like a moron. Uh, and Joe Valeno as well is another question mark. Do you keep Joe Valeno or do you move on from him? There's there's options here. Because if you keep Joe Valeno, then if you keep both Joe Valeno and Giannis and Berggren, I don't know where Casper slots into this lineup. Uh, I mean... I don't think he becomes your 13th forward. I believe that goes to Tyler Mott, Joe Valeno. But, yeah, because you, if you're going to bring Casper up, you want him to play as many games as possible. And him being a healthy scratch is not going to be him playing as many games as possible. So, you know, it's depth, you know, like I said, depth, guys. Um, he's, like I said, it's a depth signing. Dude, Dude's on a like minimum league con minimum league minimum contract so for a year it's it's a nothing signing essentially uh much like Sel- Sheldon Dries he's on a two year two way contract so it's just another nothing signing he's just Grand Rapids depth uh but then we get into some of the fun stuff Cam Talbot Cam Talbot I was happy with the signing because one of the big things that caused Detroit to miss the playoffs last season was goaltending. Now, obviously, Alex Lyon did whatever the fuck he could to get Detroit as close to the playoffs as possible, but he was overworked. He was overplayed as hell. And that is one of the things I blame Lalonde for wholeheartedly is not splitting up like... I know, ride the hot hand. When you're a team like Detroit, you can't afford to keep splitting time between a goaltender who's hot and a goaltender who may or may not win you a game. You can't afford that. You ride the hot hand when you're in Detroit's position. But the problem with that is that they've never had two goaltenders that can get hot. James Reimer, I I wrote about in one of my articles at the Octopus Thrower. I'm a contributor there now, by the way. Uh, Go check them out. But I wrote I wrote something about uh, three unsung heroes for Detroit last season, and I put James Reimer as one of them because yes, while he was basically a heart attack on skates. And his goaltending method is unorthodox, to say the best. Um, he came in clutch at the end of the season. He did what he had to do to keep this team in contention. And, you know, I can't help but feel if Lalonde put a little bit more trust into James Reimer and let Alex Lyon rest a bit more, this team would have been in the playoffs. You know, this team would have probably been a first round out, but you never know. So, obviously, Huso being hurt all season didn't help anybody. And, yeah, I don't know. It's just it's just things I think, it's things I hate to think about, but I think about them anyways because I'm a fucking masochist. Uh, but Cam Talbot should bring stability 
Stability, stability, stability. That is the one thing Detroit has never had in a goaltender since Chris Osgood and Jimmy Howard. Uh, well, I guess Jonathan, Jonathan Bernier was there too. He was the shining light in the darkness that was the Detroit Red Wings at the time. But, you know, Cam Talbot is a career 9-12 save percentage goalie. Uh, last year with the LA Kings, he played fifty. He started fifty-two games, played fifty-four. He had a twenty-seven and twenty. He had a twenty-seven, twenty, and six record, uh, and was a nine-thirteen safe percentage goalie last season. Career nine-twelve safe percentage, like I said, and that's consistent throughout his entire career. Um, with Ottawa the year before in 22-23, he was an eight ninety-eight, which you know, that's Ottawa because Ottawa kind of fucking sucks. Uh, but then you go to Minnesota for two years, 9-15, 9-11. Calgary, 9-19. Uh, in Philadelphia, he was a 9-81. In Edmonton, the year in 2018-2019, he was an 8-93. 8-92 with Toronto. But then you get into some of his earlier years, 9-08 with Edmonton, 9-19 with Edmonton, 9-17 with Edmonton, 9-26 with the Rangers, and 9-41 with the Rangers. I believe he was drafted by the Rangers as well. So... You know, it's definitely stability. I believe there's going to be a 1A, 1B situation here. But the problem Detroit has now, somehow, is they have too many fucking goalies. They've got four goalies, five if you count Sebastian Kosa. They've got Alex Lyon, Vili Huso, Cam Talbot, Jack Campbell. Now, it's obvious that Jack Campbell's going to go to, at least it's supposedly obvious that Jack Campbell's going to go to the Grand Rapids Griffins, play with Kosa and probably John Bednar. Um, and then, you know, up on the main roster, it's going to be Talbot, who's a lion. But Eisman was pretty adamant about not wanting to run three goalies this season. So the question there is, does somebody move? Like, because you're not going to move Cam Talbot, you just signed him. Jack Campbell is, I guess, technically a guy you should, you can move, but do you really want to if you're just going to bury him in the minors? Um, so that just leaves Alex Lyon, Vili Huso. Now, I see a lot of people, and I happen to agree, that Billy Huso was the odd man out in the situation. He wasn't healthy all of last season, and he was bad last season. Granted, he started coming back into form later, like in the second half of the season, when he came back from his first injury. Then he got injured again, came back, started. then he looked good for all of the 10 minutes he played in that Edmonton game, got hurt again. And so, you know, it. he looks to be the odd man out, and like I said, I happen to agree. But you look at Alex Lyon, and as, as much as I hate to say it, he's the easier contract to move. He, I love Alex Lyon. The Red Wings love Alex Lyon. Hell, their whole release video was premised around Alex Lyon and the dog bus business line from the season thing where at practice the social Detroit Red Wings social crew asks them questions as they're going on on the yes for practice. Um, so that leads me to believe that they don't plan on getting rid of Lyon, but he's 900... His contract's $900,000 for one more year, and he's just, I I mean, he's he's a good backup. He's a fantastic backup. He can even be a 1B to, you know, a team who doesn't have a bona fide starter. So, in fact, that's what Detroit was supposed to do with him uh, this season with him and Huso. Or technically it's supposed to be Huso and Reimer, I believe. But then Lyon came in, stole the show, Huso got injured, stuff like that, so... It's, it's going to be interesting to see what Eisman does with the goaltending situation. Is he going to run three goalies again? Is he going to move Huso or Lyon or Campbell for that matter? Um, and then send somebody down to the minors like Lyon or Huso? I don't know. Nobody knows because nobody knows what the fuck Eisman's doing except for Steve Eisman. Steve Eisman is elusive. Um, but, you know, it, 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 off seasons are always fun. You know, at least I think they are. They're also incredibly stressful. But, you know, it's... It's something that just has got to get taken care of. You know, you can't run f- with four or five goalies all season. Um, so, you know, but regardless, Cam Talbot coming in helps potentially and hopefully bring stability to the Red Wings uh, in that at least. So, you know, that and that could be what brings Detroit into the playoffs this season is their goaltending you know we've seen it last season uh you know Detroit while they were scoring at a ridiculously stupid pace most of the season um one of the things that got them the buffer that they blew in the second half of the season for the playoffs was goaltending Alex Lyons stole a lot of those games so 
you know, hopefully Cam Talbot can do the same thing, but more consistently. But then we get to the biggest signing of the offseason for the for uh, Steve Eisman and the Detroit Red Wings, Vladimir Tarasenko. The Tarasenko show, baby, joins up with Showtime, and bam, we got shows in Detroit again. Um, I'm stupid, I know. But Vladimir Tarasenko was a big get. Uh, now, obviously, he's not the same player he was, you know, year three, four, five years ago when the St. Louis Blues won the Stanley Cup. But Tarasenko did win the Stanley Cup with the Florida Panthers. Um, he played for Florida and Ottawa all this uh, for the last two seasons. No, this season. He played with Ottawa. In Ottawa, he got 17 goals, 24 assists, 41 points in 57 games. And then in Florida, when he got traded to the deadline, 6 goals, 8 assists, 14 points in 19 games. For a total of 23 goals, 32 points, 55 assists, or 55 assists, 23 goals, 32 assists for 55 points in 76 games with a plus 13 rating. Granted, I imagine that's largely due to him being on the Florida Panthers, an incredibly great defensive team with the stone wall known as Sergei Bobrovsky behind them. So it's uh, it's great. He's definitely the guy you want to bring in because he's not, he's not expensive either. He signed a actually pretty reasonable contract. It was a two year two year contract at four point seven five million. Sorry the video for it just fucking played it because I clicked on the wrong thing on Twitter. Um two year contract at four point seven five million and what's great about this is that they're basically only paying him seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. Um I say that as it like Detroit's not paying him four million dollars but what happened was right after the Vladimir Tarasenko signing, Detroit traded Robbie Fabry in a conditional fourth round pick for 2025, which I believe was the fourth round pick they got from the Debrinka trade. Um, was that that? No, I don't think that was the conditional fourth. I can't remember. Um, but for they they traded Robbie Fabry to the Anaheim Ducks for another goaltender, mind you. But that guy's just an ECHL guy, so he's probably just going to play in Toledo. But. Yeah, and while I'm sad to see Fabry go, he was a contract that needed to be moved because obviously you weren't going to re-sign him in the offseason, or if you did, it wasn't going to be for nearly as much. But, well, clearly they weren't going to re-sign him if they were planning, if they were looking to trade him. But, you know, they, Robbie Fabry's contract was $4 million. Tarasenko's is $4.75 million. You basically just replaced Robbie Fabry with Vladimir Tarasenko for an extra $750,000. That's literally all you did. So Detroit still has over twenty million in dollars in cap. I believe it's twenty three million. Uh, Cider and Raymond both have to be re-signed. Obviously, those contracts are going to be interesting to see how they play out. Just because you know there, there's two ways they can go. There's the uh, bridge deals, which I don't want them to do. Because that would not help the team in the long run. Obviously, you deal with it when that bridge comes. But it's not something I would want to see them do. But if that's what happens, that's what happens. And, you know, so a bridge deal for four or five years, maybe, at it'll, they'll come in cheaper. Uh, if a bridge deal for Raymond would probably look like six, probably something like the Zegers contract. And Cider would probably look at right around the same for four or five years. And now, guess granted, the cap's going up, but that doesn't help the Red Wings in the long term because if the cap goes up, players are going to want more money, and more money leads to less cap space, as the Toronto Maple Leafs this season, as, you know, that cap space went up. But now they have less cap space because they gave William Nylander and Austin Matthews massive races. So... You know, it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. If you go long term, then I'm fine with you just overpaying the fuck out of them. If you have to give Mo Sider nine million, nine nine and a half million dollars to go to eight years, do it 100. percent If you have to give Lucas Raymond eight and a half million dollars to go eight years, go ahead, do it. I don't care. If you can get them locked up long term, beautiful, perfect. If you can get them to go into their prime, like to not need a contract until they're into their prime beautiful do it because at that point the salary cap will be high enough if it keeps raising like we think it is um the salary cap will be high enough to where you can pay them money you can give them money and still have enough cap space to be able to do stuff um 
Now, eventually, you'll probably run into the same problem as you do with bridge deals, you know. For, say, most cider goes through those eight years and wins, like, I don't know, go to the extreme and he wins three Norris Cups. You know, I doubt that's going to happen in the league that has Roman Yossi, uh, Quinn Hughes, why could I not remember his name, Kale McCarr. Uh, you know, with those guys in the league, Outsider's going to be hard-pressed to win a Norris Trophy. But it's possible. It's not out of the realm of possibility. Maybe Quinn Hughes gets hurt, Cam Carr has a down year, stuff like that, you know? Um, but, yes, yeah, say that happens, then Outsider can go and be like, hey, in these eight years, I won three Norris Cups and was your top pair defender the entire time. So give me a eleven and a half million dollars right now in what you know or or whatever then you come to that bridge where it's like oh shit this dude wants a lot of money but like i said cap goes cap keeps going up won't be much of a problem anymore so you know it's going to be interesting to see how that happens um but i'm glad with, I'm, I'm ecstatic with the tarasenko signing i'm ecstatic with the talbot signing i'm very happy with gustafs's signing um, and then everybody else is just depth, you know, it's incredible depth, mind you, but it is just depth and, you know, we've got a pretty decent team here. Now, granted, they're likely not going to have the scoring touch they did last season. Sprong's not here. Ghost Spare's not here. Perron's gone, which by the way, I just want to talk about this. Ottawa, what the fuck are you doing? I've seen so many Ottawa fans coping with signing David Perron, a 36 year old David Perron to a $4 million contract for two years. That's what he had in Detroit, mind you. And he showed, all of his analytics showed that he was slowing down. The visual, the eye test also showed that he was slowing down considerably. And I've seen so many fans cope, Ottawa fans coping with it because obviously Ottawa fans are piss babies and they don't understand that bad deals happen. No, they believe their team can do no wrong at this point. Um, Even though, they can very much do a lot wrong, but yeah, it's it, it, they that that's too much for Prawn. Prawn's worth no more than two and a half million at this point as a third liner. So I don't know what they were thinking there, but kudos on Prawn to Prawn and getting his bag. Like I'm not going to be upset for any team cashing in on money. Like if the team offers you fucking like five million if if you're like 37 years old and a team offers you five and a half million you're taking that all of i'm taking that all of live long day sorry i gotta drink some water or chug water my bad wow that went down hard but anyways yeah so it this is a, this is a semi-decent team you know this is a team that could probably make the playoffs too um, I, I'm going to assume they're not going to have the same production they did last season, but hopefully defensively they, they're better and they don't have to outscore all their problems. Uh, looking at daily faceoff, they predict their top lines. I don't believe this is how the lines are going to go, uh, at least not entirely. But if you look at daily faceoff, they have the first line being Alex to bring Dylan Lark and Lucas Raymond. That's a fine first line. It's an incredible first line. And a lot of people seeing that that first line can work fantastically. Their second line is Vladimir Tarasenko, JT Comfort, Patrick Kane. Now, here's my problem with the second line. That is a lot. That is solid scoring talent. You know, Patrick Kane defeated Vladimir Tarasenko with JT Comfort to cover defensively. That's fine. However, that is a slow as fuck line. And if they ever get trapped in the D zone, I am scared for what's going to happen. Because JT Comfort can only cover for so much. And if they're put out there with, say, Eric Gustafson, Gustafson and Oli Mata that are back there, I don't know how you're going to be able to figure that out. Straight up, I don't. I don't know how you're going to be able to properly defend that without giving 85% of your fan base a heart attack. So, personally, how I would do it is switch, switch Raymond and Kane. Just swap Raymond and Patrick Kane. Uh, because Alex Dabrinkit, for all of his defensive woes, he wasn't very bad. He was actually pretty solid defensively last season. Uh, plus, you've got Dylan Larkin up there, and that line will usually be out with Ben Sherratt, Mort Sider, Simon Edvinson, Jeff Petrie. You know, they're going to be out with some of the better defenders on the team, and 
you know, it's 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 just thought. I, I don't know if I would necessarily trust the line of Vladimir Terzenko, Patrick Kane, and JT Comfer to be studs. Um, you know, in the offensive zone, I'm sure they'll be fantastic. You slam JT Comfer's ass in front to make room. Uh, Patrick Kane on the outside and Vladimir Tarasenko with a one-timer shot on the uh, opposite end of the circle. That's a fantastic line. But if they get put in the D zone, like if something happens and they end up having to backtrack into the D zone, I'm worried about it. Uh, next, they project Daily Face Off for Zex. Their third line to be Michael Rasmus and Andrew Kopp, Giannis and Berggren. Obviously, this depends heavily on them, on Detroit re-signing Giannis and Berggren. Um... I believe Berggren has arbitration rights. So does Joe Valeno. So it, either Detroit's trading Berggren and Valeno or they're signing both of them. One of the other. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know if I necessarily trust that line either. Um, not that I don't trust it because Rasmussen and Kopp are incredibly good defensively. Berggren not so much. But I still think, just based off of last year, mind you, that you put Fisher back on that line with Kopp and, and Rasmussen. Um... And that because they just melded so fucking well last season, and then you move Berggren down to the fourth line to give fourth line depth scoring, and he'll be on a line with Valeno and probably Tyler Mott or Marco Casper, um, all three of which are pretty good defensively. So and Valeno has a semi decent scoring touch because he had what ten goals last season, eleven goals, something like that. So. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely something to consider. That's how my lineup will be. So just, just so we can get it completely out there, uh, my lineup for the Detroit Red Wings would be as far as forwards go: Alex DeBrincat, Dylan Larkin, Patrick Kane in the first line. Second line: Tarasenko, Comfer, Raymond. Uh, third line: Rasmussen, Kopp, Berggren. Fourth line: Uh. Mott slash Casper Valeno Fisher, you know, or Mott slash Mazer Valeno Britt Berggren. Fisher goes on the third line. My bad. Um, and then defensively, it's going to be a bit of a toss up defensively because you've got Simon Edvinson that's going to be up. Albert Johansson has to be up. He's not waiver eligible and he, he has he has to be put on waivers to go sent down. And almost you're almost certainly going to certainly going to lose him on waivers. Um, but they have their defensive pairings as it stands right now on daily faceoff. Ben Schrott Sider on the top line on the top pairing, which is okay. We have seen it work last season once Schrott decide, realized you know okay. His f- fuck it gun ho style isn't going to work out on this team. Um, he definitely improved defensively last season, so I'm fine with that. The second pairing, Edvinson Petrie, they really worked wonders in uh, the last part of the season when Edvinson came up. Uh, Jeff Jeff Petrie definitely took a step forward when he was paired up with Simon Edvinson, uh, uh, which I believe is due to him having a partner that he knows he can rely on. Like, obviously, he was able to rely on Sherrod a bit more, but I think it was more of a dad-father-son sort of deal. Like, the veteran Jeff Petrie realized he has this kid on his parent with it, paired with him now, so he can't, you know, necessarily, he's got to be more steadfast defensively, and he's able to bring in, you know, show him that, hey, offense is also good. Um... And then they predict the third pairing being Ole Mata and Eric Gustafson, which is definitely one of the third lines of all t- third pairings of all time. No, I definitely think Ole Mata is a good person to pair with Eric Gustafson, but the problem is they're both left-handed, so I don't know how that's going to work necessarily. I think if personally, I think the best move would be to move Mata and put Hall there, because at least Hall's right-handed, and then you switch out. Johansson and Hall and whatnot. You rotate through all these, some of these guys because Johansson's also a left wing, left wing, left uh, defense, left handed defenseman. So the only th- reason I say move Mata to put Hall there is because Hall's right handed, and it's better to have a right handed defenseman on the right side than a left handed defenseman on the left side. <laughs> Though I know Johansson and Gustafsson, I don't think either of them would necessarily lose much in the way of being able to play if they were put on the left on the right side but it's it, it's just better to have the handedness of the player on the 
correct side of the position they're playing. Um, and the power play units look lethal, dude. They look lethal. First one they predict to be Lucas Raymond, Dylan Larkin, Patrick Kane, Alex Debrinkit, Eric Gustafson. The second power play unit they predict to be Vladimir Tarasenko, JT Comfer, Jonathan Berger, and Marit Seider, Joe Foleno. Now, I will say this. I do not believe if, I mean, if Berggren is on the team, yes, he's probably going to be on the second power play. I do not believe Valeno goes on the second power play unit, though. I believe they put Rasmussen or Fisher on the second power play unit just because they can be a big pain in the ass presence and they are also great at board battles. They are fantastic. They are much better at board battles than Joe Valeno is, I believe. Uh, and then the penalty kill, that's pretty obvious. Uh, you know, first penalty kill, Comfort Cop, Sherrod Sider, then Larkin, Tyler. They have Tyler Mott on the second power play penalty kill unit, um, which is which it makes sense because he's a fantastic penalty killer. Um, and then, you know, you'll have other guys out there like Fisher and Rasmussen will be out there. You'll have uh, Valeno out there, probably... I don't know, Raymond will probably get some reps on the PK if needed, like in dire situations. So there's there's options there. They're not horribly they're not bad defensively this season. Um and they're predicting their goalies will be Alex Lyon and Cam Talbot. So I can't argue with that. But yeah, this next season is gonna be pretty interesting just because of the new like obviously new faces it always makes the season interesting. But I'm interested to see how Eisenman deals with the massive amounts of defensemen and goaltenders we have because we have a lot of both, and uh, there's not space on the roster for all of them, especially since you plan on bringing guys like Edvinson, like Johansson, like Berggren up, and Casper, Mazur. You know, you've got a bunch of prospects banging on that door, too, that you got to bring up. So Eisenman had his presser, which means he's likely done with free agency and stuff like that. I do believe that there are still trades in the works just because why wouldn't there be? Um, you don't acquire all of these pieces and keep all these pieces if you don't plan on moving players. So, you know, that's just my two cents on it. Um, other than that, I'm excited for this next season. Uh, and it's it, it's going to be fun. Like, if last season were anything to go off of, this is a fun team and definitely a team that will be worth watching next season. I know a lot of people are still down on the Red Wings because of their, for lack of a better term, lackluster uh, off season and draft. But you know, I, I I don't think it's nearly as bad as people are making it out to be. So that's gonna be it for this episode today, guys. I hope you guys did enjoy this episode, and we didn't even get to talk about Utah or um, Arizona, like Lou Lamorello backing away and get dropping the coyotes brand back and away from the coyotes brand stuff like that um we didn't there, there's a lot of stuff we didn't talk about like the uh, nhl awards happened florida won the stanley cup by the way and that was a fantastic series too i that was one of the funnest game uh stanley cup final series i've ever watched in my entire life so maybe we'll talk about that later i think it's a bit too late to talk about stanley cup though so yeah, anyways, thank you guys so much for listening to this. I do promise there will be more episodes in the future. When, I cannot say, but there will be new episodes. Um, and they will be on various topics, stuff like that. So my next episode will probably be on me predicting the team's lineup, moves, stuff like that uh, will happen, talking about potential prospects that will make the team and whatnot. Obviously, development camp's going on right now. Pavel Datsuk made the NHL Hall of Fame. We're going to talk about that. So plenty of stuff to come in the future which means there's plenty of episodes in the future to come hopefully soon but regardless like i said thank you guys so much for listening and tuning in to the flying wheel podcast i am always going to be your host the mexanadian and i will talk to you guys later adios boys